I am incredibly excited to present some of the work that I've done throughout my PhD, some of what I studied and learned. The title of my thesis is Data Efficient Robotic Manipulation of Deformable One-Dimensional Objects with Unreliable Dynamics. So to break that down, we're doing robots with arms and hands that manipulate objects, specifically one-dimensional deformable objects, and that means things like ropes and cables. And finally, we're going to focus on the challenges of data efficiency and on predicting how the objects will move, in other words, unreliable dynamics. We can also phrase this as a research question, and there are four key words I want to point out here. The first two are inaccurate models and limited real-world data. So these are the two core research challenges that we're going to be addressing. The next one is plan. Of course, there are model-free RL methods and behavior cloning methods that don't use dynamics and don't use any planning. But my work is all model-based planning. And the fourth keyword is deformable objects. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Why do I want to focus on deformable objects? Well, one reason is that they are everywhere, and there are lots of important applications where the robot might have to interact with a deformable object. You might need to fold laundry, uh, install a cable harness, cook some food, do surgery, take care of people, or manufacture things like carbon fiber. And in all these applications, the objects that the robot interacts with are deformable. And that's one big reason, but there's also another reason, which is that deformable objects challenge a lot of fundamental assumptions that we make when doing model-based planning for manipulating rigid objects. So here I've listed three of those. Known dynamics models, full actuation, and minimal occlusion. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the first, which is that normally when we're manipulating rigid objects, we assume we know how the object will move. We have a firm grasp on it, and we know where our hand moves. We essentially know where the entire object will be at all times. And that's really useful for planning. Deformable objects obviously break that assumption. The object can bend, it can move, it can make contact in ways that change its shape. And that makes the problem for model-based planning a lot harder. And as I said, I'm going to specifically focus on deformable one-dimensional objects, things like ropes, cables, and hoses. And I'll start with some prior work on the kinds of dynamics models used for deformable objects and why they might be unreliable. And before that, a very, very brief introduction to model-based planning uh, for those who are uninitiated. So let's say we have a robot here, and it's supposed to grab the end of this vacuum hose and move it over to the mess, and we'll green circle and, and clean, up, clean that up. The model-based planning approach here would be, first, you pick some type of action. So that could be something like a direction and a distance to move the gripper. You then need to predict how the object, in this case the hose, will move or change shape given that action. And then you do some kind of search. So maybe you sample a bunch of different types of actions. Uh, you see where those lead you. Do they reach the goal? Do they get you closer to the goal? And you iteratively do this until you get a good sequence of actions, sequence of actions that take you to the goal. The prediction of how the object will change shape based on the initial state and actions is called dynamics. And the process of iteratively using the dynamics to solve the task or reach the goal is called planning. Okay, so when we talk about dynamics models for deformable objects, um, we can split this into two categories. One would be physics-based models, and the other would be learned. And of course, you can have hybrids. In physics-based models, um, we start with first principles and develop things like mass spring damper models, finite element models, or discrete elastic rods. And there are some pros and cons here. So some pros is that they're based in physics, so we know generally how they will behave, and they have interpretable parameters that we can tune. But tuning those parameters can be quite difficult. If I have a real rope that I'm looking at as a robot, I don't really know what those stiffness and damping parameters are. And even if I interact with the rope, it's still quite difficult to determine those parameters. On the other hand, for learned models, which will be things like neural networks, we don't quite have the same problem with tuning the parameters because we're observing the real rope and we can fit directly to its motion. But on the other side, we don't really know how these models are going to behave for new actions that we haven't tried or for new ropes that we've never seen before. So clearly there are some challenges with both of these methods. And uh, you'll see both methods used throughout this thesis. Um, a lot of the methods are agnostic to exactly which of these you're using. But the focus is actually going to be on a broader problem, 
which is that in practice, any of these models are likely to be unreliable. So why would these models be unreliable? Well, for learning-based methods especially, you might just not have enough training data. And often training data is expensive to gather, so this is a real problem. Or maybe you have a change in the type of data. So you trained with one rope, and now you have a different one. Um, that can be true for physics-based models too. You have one rope and then another, you have to retune your parameters. Uh, for physics-based models, you might also just be completely missing some phenomenon. You might be making intentional simplifying assumptions in the modeling phase, which then may show up later in the real world. Um, and so then in that case, the model will be unreliable. And this is a problem because when you use these models for planning, there's a well-known problem where the planners tend to exploit the imperfections or unreliabilities in your dynamics model and produce actions that are for which the dynamics are not reliable and you get plans that don't actually solve the task. So I've kind of talked about this unreliability intuitively. What does that mean quantitatively? So here are three possible ways you could quantify reliability. You could, be, you could use prediction error, which is maybe the distance between the two shapes or two points on the shape. Um, prior work has used utility, which is the expected reduction in task error. You could also use some notion of uncertainty. So maybe you place a Gaussian over some state variables um, and use that to represent unreliability. Um, these are all perfectly reasonable ways to do it. In this talk, we're focusing mostly on prediction error. So that's a little background on what a dynamics model is uh, and why the dynamics for deformable objects might be unreliable. And now I'll introduce the work I've done towards addressing this. So I'm gonna present this diagram to kind of organize the different chapters. So on the left, we have two capabilities. We have learning dynamics, and we have learning reliability. And then you could do that in one of two situations, either in simulation or in the real world. In chapter one, we're gonna sort of build up the foundation here and, and just, uh, I'll explain how we do learning dynamics and learning reliability just in simulation with a little real world demo. Um, but of course, learning and simulation is not the end goal. Uh, so in chapter two, we introduce a method that improves the data efficiency such that we can practically learn the reliability component in the real world. But we're still not learning the dynamics in the real world. And if there's a sim to real gap where simulation is not quite as accurate as we need it to be for the task, what do we do? In chapter three, we introduce an adaptation component that adapts the dynamics that we learned in simulation uh, to the real world. And then finally, we expand sort of the general capabilities of the system um, towards new tasks or parts of the task by introducing grasping and regrasping. So starting with chapter one, uh, which is work published in Science Robotics, we're going to investigate how to learn the dynamics and the reliability starting in simulation. The main question here is, when should we trust a dynamics model? In the paper, we also explore a second question of what to do if you're in a state where the model is unreliable, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to discuss that part. So, okay, I talked about dynamics and how they can be unreliable in certain, when certain phenomena are not modeled or not present in the training data. And here's one example of that. So here we show a deformable one-dimensional object being dragged on the surface, on a surface with and without obstacles. Uh, we're going to call the dynamics on the right the uh, unconstrained dynamics, where there's no obstacles and we're not going to overstretch the rope. And the dynamics on the left uh, are going to be the full dynamics. Uh, and sometimes I'll refer to this as free space or contact dynamics, um, but just know that the general concept is, is a little bit broader. I'm not sure why these aren't playing. Hopefully the next one. Um, you can imagine the ropes being dragged around. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a problem with later videos, we'll, we'll see. It's not too important. Um, all right, so the point I want to make here is about the difficulty of learning these different dynamics. So trying to learn a model, model that predicts the root movement of the rope and all the changes in shape um, in the presence of obstacles is quite difficult, requiring uh, lots of data, which is expensive to collect, and still not generalizing that well to new environments. Given the massive space of possible obstacles, the complexity of deformable contact, and the cost of collecting any of this data, 
we can't expect to accurately learn the full dynamics everywhere, but we perhaps can accurately learn the unconstrained dynamics in regions that are relevant to the task. So if we learn the unconstrained dynamics accurately, we can use those in plan. But there's a challenge because now those dynamics are unreliable in some regions of state action space. So our proposed method is to learn the unconstrained dynamics and to learn what we call a model deviation estimator or MDE that learns when the unconstrained dynamics model will be accurate or not. The basic argument here is that it's easier to learn when the unconstrained dynamics model will be wrong than it is to learn the full dynamics. So we should need fewer data. So what should an MDE do for this rope dragging example? Um, the free space predictions coming from the unconstrained dynamics should essentially just pull straight into the object because it doesn't know it's there. And the MDE's job is to tell us that the model will be unreliable in this case. So we formalize this uh, in what we call the model deviation requirement. Uh, the model deviation is the distance between the predicted next state and the true next state. And we have some threshold delta for the maximum allowed error. We need to evaluate this in planning, but of course we don't know the future true states. So we train a classifier G um, to approximate that function. The classifier takes in the state, the action, the next state, and importantly, the environment, and predicts whether the deviation is, will be below delta or not. And we can use this classifier in planning to tell us whether the unconstrained dynamics will be accurate. So how does that look in planning? Well, in this paper, we use a fairly standard kinodynamic RRT, where the classifier is a constraint. So the planner grow, grows the tree randomly from, uh, by sampling some random state S rand. We find the nearest node in the tree as near. We then sample a random action, feed that through our unconstrained dynamics model, which gives us a prediction of the new state S new. And then critically, we take this whole transition and we feed it into the MDE, which gives us a prediction of how reliable this transition will be. In this sort of toy example, probably not too reliable. And so the classifier output is below 0.5. We, we just don't add it to the tree. So now we have all the basic building blocks. Here's a diagram that sums up kind of the whole method. Uh, there's some components here like recovery that I, that I didn't touch on. Um, but in short, I'm consists of two data collection phases, one for the unconstrained dynamics, and then one for the classifier. And then after this, the learned models are used in a closed loop process of planning, replanning, and recovery. Just to contrast this, your standard just learn the full dynamics method would skip step one and would collect maybe a few orders of magnitude more data in step two, uh, and then try to fit the full dynamics to that, and you wouldn't have an MDE. But what we really want to do is have step two be in the real world. So the less data you need for that step, the better, um, which is, so the, the proposed approach helps in that regard. So here are some results. Um, first, for the rope dragging task, we have this kind of floating gripper that's pulling this rope around. Um, and the goal is to get the other end of the rope that it's not holding to some goal region. Um, and we also have a dual arm rope manipulation task where you're sort of holding the two ends of the rope up in the air. The arms are kind of hidden in this example. Um, we try to get the center of the rope to some goal point. Um, the unconstrained dynamics are only accurate really when you're pulling the rope in the, in the rope dragging case, as opposed to trying to push into it. So the planner finds paths that ends with a straight line pulling motion towards the goal. And this is one example of how this classifier is doing more than just some approximation of collision tracking. In the uh, dual arm manipulation example, you notice that it keeps the endpoints fairly close to each other. Um, because if you were to pull them really far apart, that would stretch the rope, which would uh, be for which the unconstrained dynamics would produce bad predictions. So again, the classifier is um, preventing the planner from doing that. Um, which is another example of how this is more than just an approximation to collision check. Finally, we show how our method could be applied to real-world tasks. For this demonstration, we're using models still trained in simulation and just directly playing the trajectories out on the robot. Um, so I want to be clear, there's no perception of learning happening yet. Uh, that will be the next two chapters. There's more uh, examples on the paper, but this is, I think, my favorite one. We have this automotive setting. Um, Dimitri actually went to a junkyard to get parts for a car for this, um, <laughs> and it looks really cool. So here it's taking these lifting straps uh, off, off this engine block mock-up thing, uh, and the trick here is to avoid snagging 
on any of the many little hooks or protrusions there are. Um, and we have the, the other one where it's trying to sort of prepare to install a windshield wiper hose. Um, yeah. Okay. So I did show you a real robot video, but again, the learning and planning was done in simulation. And the challenge here is that we needed a kind of a lot of data, um, even to learn the reliability. Um, and the sim to real gap was still pretty big. So the simulated rope just wasn't that similar to the real world rope. Um, so directly applying these things in the real world didn't work that great. So in this chapter, we propose a data augmentation method, which improves the data efficiency and lets us learn the reliability in the real world. Uh, and this was published in RSS on um, I'll take a quick pause if we have one or two Quick questions. Chapter one. So the videos you showed us for chapter one depend on chapter two. No, we we did learning and planning for. We basically mocked the real world in sim, ran the thing, took the joint trajectories, played them on the robot. And they were. Well, <laughs> they worked in the in the few videos that we showed, but it, it was a movie, <laughs> right? There's no perception feedback, right? So it's. It, um, and the uh, success rate was not exactly high. So uh, uh, it was sort of just a demonstration to see what it could look like. Um, the future videos you see for this chapter and the next are, are gonna have like actual perception and planning in the real world. Can you say like a lot of data, how much is a lot? Yeah, so because, let's see. So if you were to do the data collection that we needed for this first chapter in the real world, um, you would have been collecting many hundreds of trajectories, each which would have taken like, you know, a bunch of seconds to do. Um, so probably a few days. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna move on in the interest of time, um, but I'll take questions at the, at the, next, uh, the next break. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna be proposing a data augmentation method. And specifically, oh, yeah, specifically this is gonna be for the MDE, so the, the reliability part. Um, we're going to start with our pre-trained dynamics still from simulation. We're going to use those dynamics to plan and execute in the real world. Um, and we're going, initially that won't be very good, right? Because we don't know when the unconstrained dynamics are accurate. Um, but by doing this online process of collecting some data, training the MDE uh, on the augmented version of that data, now the planner will produce better paths um, and iteratively improve the MDE. So before we see how the augmentation is done, some prior work. Data augmentation has mainly been used in computer vision uh, to great effect. For instance, in image classification tasks, sometimes you can apply random rotations or props to the input image, and that you know, the goldfish is still a goldfish. Um, so when you train the model, you get improved generalization uh, when you use augmentation than when you don't. But in manipulation for learning MDEs, dynamics, um, other learning-based methods, we aren't using images, or maybe we are using images, but we're also using physical or geometric data about a robot. So the challenge, part of the challenge here is we need to augment a different type of data. So in this work, we're gonna be augmenting trajectories of geometric state and action data. And that's gonna mean things like voxel grids, point clouds, joint configurations, or object poses. For learning the MDE, this means a state action state transition. So two pair, a pair of two states, which include a point cloud representation of the rope, which is those two red lines. Uh, we have the rope, the robot joint configuration and all the robot geometry and a Vox grid that represents the environment. So that's the type of data that we need to augment, but in what space are we going to be augmenting them? Well, I don't think there's one universal answer here, but in this work, we augment in the space of a rigid body transformation applied to the moving objects in the scene. And so these are two examples of what I mean by that. Um, in the rope manipulation example, you have this, this pair of rope states. We can take that trajectory of rope and sort of move it around with a rigid body transformation. And then we have this uh, cluttered planar pushing scenario um, where we're looking kind of top down on these moving cylinders. And again, we're taking the trajectory of the moved objects and augmenting them. So how does this work? Well, one of the contributions here is a sort of abstract framework for data augmentation as an optimization problem, where we argue that you want to maximize validity 
relevance, and diversity. We define an augmented example as valid if it obeys the laws of physics. We say that it's relevant if it's similar to data that would be seen when performing the target task. And we say that diversity is maximized when the transformations applied to a given example are unique. So in the paper, we propose definitions for validity, relevance, and diversity in somewhat general terms um, that aren't tractable. So then we propose a tractable approximation specifically for robotic manipulation. So I'll go through each term and explain visually what they mean. The first term encourages the transformations to be uniformly distributed towards some random T target. So T here is the rigid body transformation, and that's our decision variable. The next four terms define the validity and relevance for the moved object state. So for example, the rope. We want to stay within some workspace. Uh, we have a term for penalizing invalid transformation parameters directly. And then the next two terms preserve contacts and near contacts between the moved objects and the environment. <clears throat> the last term preserves the validity of the robot state, um, which preserves grasps or contacts that the robot makes with the moved objects. So here's an animation of the augmentation optimization procedure. In this example, we're augmenting trajectories of rope of length two. This is the original example. The uh, states in blue and green are the current iterant within the optimization process. So green points are initially occupied, blue points are in free space. And the white arrow shows the randomly sampled T target direction that we're trying to move. So we first step along the white arrow, that improves diversity. And then we project by uh, taking gradient set step on those loss terms uh, to optimize validity and relevance. And we repeat this process a bunch of times, um, iterating between diversity and validity and relevance. And uh, the final example looks like that. Here we show two additional augmentations for the same original input. And that illustrates the diversity of augmentations that we get. Next, we show three additional examples of augmentations for a different original example. So we evaluate this data augmentation approach in two simulated experiments and one real-world experiment. Uh, the bulk of our quantitative results come from SIM, but the videos aren't that cool, so I'll uh, just briefly summarize the results. In short, we see a 22% increase in success rate on the rope manipulation task, and a 14% decrease in prediction error in a multi-object cluttered planar pushing task. Finally, we brought back our favorite uh, evaluation of bimanual rope manipulation in the real world. Uh, but again, so the goal here is to place, we're now hooking or sort of, you know, putting the strap on the engine. So the goal is to place the strap underneath this um, sort of hook in the front. And the video here starts at iteration one. So initially both methods do poorly, but as we run it longer, the method with augmentation gets uh, higher success more quickly. After 30 iterations of this online learning, we then froze the models for evaluation. Without augmentation, it succeeded in seven out of 26 trials. Uh, and with augmentation, the rope successfully placed the robot successfully placed the rope uh, under the engine in 13 out of 26 trials. <clears throat> so in summary, we propose a data augmentation method for robotic manipulation. We frame augmentation as an optimization problem. And we show in three experiment, experiments that training on augmentations improves performance on downstream tasks in the low data regime. All right, quick pause for questions. So with the data augmentation, um, I'm trying to sort of understand the intuition for what you're doing. Are you sort of taking your like, call it a baseline joint space trajectory and sort of wrapping it in like a cylinder and exploring those different perturbations? Um, we don't need to do any approximations like wrapping it in a cylinder. Or not literally a cylinder, but you're like- we, we know the sort of the geometry of all the things we're augmenting and the various loss terms about preserving contacts um, ensure that we can do this kind of you know, augmentation by moving it throughout the workspace while trying to maintain things that would, you know, like contacts uh, that would affect the sort of validity of the physics of it. 
but that's the right intuition. We're taking it, we're sort of moving it around the workspace to, to cover that better without having the robot actually having to do all that itself. Um, can you comment on like the generality of some of these loss terms? Do you think you could apply it to like rigid body dynamics? Yeah. So um, this example that I show down here is not deformable. Um, some other sort of notes on generality. This uh, plane pushing case has sort of dynamic collisions, right? Non-trivial velocities, um, and accelerations that also well, accelerations aren't in the data set, but of course the objects do accelerate. And that data can also be augmented, right? We know how to apply rigid body transformations to velocities. Um, so in, in that case, in, in, from that sense, we're trying to show generality through these two quite different types of experiments, but it's not perfect, right? There are definitely things that would either, if present, would, would mean that we're producing augmentations that aren't valid. Let's say you're doing this rope manipulation task and somebody uh, put a fan over somewhere in the room. And so if you go into this region of what looks like free space, the rope actually will blow and change shape. Um, that's not accounted for, so you would produce augmentations that are, in some sense, not correct. Um, and it's also, on the other side, it's also rather conservative. So we're not trying to augment the deformation itself. We're not producing new deformation to the objects, um, because doing that is quite hard. That requires solving essentially the original dynamics learning problem. Um, so we tried to strike a middle ground with, yes, we think we could apply this to a bunch of different tasks, um, but also it's not as hard as the original problem of, of modeling the dynamics. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, but I'm um, happy to take more questions at the end. Okay, so if we zoom back out here, we're, we're looking at this pipeline for rope manipulation. We still have kind of a big limitation, which is that in order to learn the free space rope dynamics, and have them be accurate to the real world, what we needed to do for, that, for the, for the um, data augmentation paper, we had a special data collection step in the real world where we collected real world unconstrained rope dynamics. And that's not great because we had to sort of change our environment, right, and engineer this special data collection step. Um, but this was necessary because the free space or unconstrained dynamics we learned in SIM aren't just, you can't just have directly apply those in planning. Um, there is a, enough of a SIM to real gap that really what you want to do is some kind of adaptation. So in this chapter, we consider how best to pre-train the unconstrained dynamics in simulation, and then efficiently adapt that to the real world where there is this sim to real gap. So there's been a lot of prior work on adaptation, specifically in the sim to real scenario. Um, but generally, all these methods try to fit the entire data set. And we might not want to do that here. So if we're collecting data in, in the real environment, you know, we've got the rope and the car and everything, the rope's gonna make contact. And that, those contact dynamics are different from our unconstrained dynamics. So the intuition here is we don't, probably don't wanna to fit to that data. If we do, it'll make all of our dynamics kind of moderately bad everywhere. Um, in other words, we only want to adapt to some subset of the target data the subset that's similar to the source state or the unconstrained dynamics from simulation. So curriculum learning methods get close to this um, by training on intermediate subsets of the data or intermediate easier tasks. But at the end, they all still attempt to fit all of the data. The challenge here is that adaptation methods typically fail when the gap between the source and target environment is large. But as I said, the gap is larger in some regions than in others. The unconstrained dynamics in SIM are kind of similar to the unconstrained dynamics in the real world, but the, they are very different from the contact dynamics. So our key insight is to improve data efficiency by focusing the model adaptation on regions where the source and target dynamics are similar. So at a high level, our method works by dynamically reweighting the loss for each transition in the data set the weights are near zero if the dynamics are dissimilar and near one if the dynamics are similar. We assume that before adaptation, the learned dynamics is a reasonable approximation of the source dynamics. So we would expect that low error transitions in the target environment would be from regions of similar dynamics. So in this plant watering example, the dynamics in the middle here are pretty dissimilar from the source dynamics. The interaction between the water and the plant and sort of splashing over the edge is unlike anything that was seen in the source dynamics. 
Yeah. Uh, whereas the poor on the right has a low prediction error, is similar to the source environment. Um, and so those are the kinds of dynamics we want to adapt. But critically, we're not going to assume we have this, the sort of pre-split data set. We're just getting a bunch of data like this. Some of it looks like this. Some of it's dissimilar, some of it's similar. We're trying to adapt to the stuff that's similar. Mm -hmm. yes. How do you know what's similar and what's dissimilar? They look pretty similar to me. So here we're relying on, on the same notion of sort of prediction error uh, for, for similar or not. So, the, so again, the intuition is if we train a model on the source dynamics that takes in the volume of the water and the angle of the pore, et cetera, and we apply it to the data in the middle, it has higher. We look at the real prediction versus the um, uh, prediction versus what actually happens, there's higher. If you do that to the example on the far right, it's lower. So stuff that is lower, we're going to say is similar. How do you measure fluid differences? OK, so I don't want to dive too much into this experiment because we're going to try to focus on rope manipulation. But here, we've super simplified things. So it's only the volume of the liquid in the state uh, in, the, in the two containers. Yeah. Um, OK. So uh, that's a little bit about the problem setup. So we, we combine, we have a sort of a specific adaptation method, and we combine that with the previous framework for um, planning, uh, and that's called focus. So in online adaptation, the robot iteratively plans using the learned dynamics, executes the plan, and uses the collected data to adapt to the dynamics. Here we're also, again, using MDEs. So we also learn where the adaptive dynamics will be accurate. And we're using that again to bias the planner towards regions where the source and target dynamics are similar. So here's the full loss we use for training. Uh, we have sort of a standard prediction error loss, s hat t minus st. And we're going to weight each transition by wt. The wt is again a function of the prediction error, sort of reweighted and shuffled so that high prediction error means low weight, and low prediction error means high weight. The function Cj controls the sort of hardness of this sigmoid thresholding um, so that it's very soft uh, at the beginning of training and then transitions to a harder, almost binary 0, 1 weighting as the number of training steps j increases. We can visualize how these weights change during the course of training. So we have a bunch of histograms here. The very bottom histogram shows at the start of training, the WTs are basically all just some middle-ish value. And then as training progresses, some examples get a low weight near zero, and some get a higher weight near one, and it's pretty strongly bimodal. And we can inspect these examples that get low and high weight to confirm that our intuition, which is that examples with high weight are going to be things that are similar to the unconstrained dynamics, so in the rope manipulation case, not deforming on anything, whereas the examples that are given low weight are going to be things like this that are sort of bent on the obstacles where the unconstrained dynamics aren't reliable. So we evaluated this method in two domains, by manual rope manipulation and plant watering. My collaborator, Alex Agasa, who's a PhD student at CNU, is responsible for the plant watering experiments. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the rope manipulation. The main evaluation here is in the online adaptation setting. So we first did this in simulation. So the problem is to adapt from one simulation of the unconstrained rope dynamics. So you have free, free space rope in one simulation to a new different simulation where the ropes physics are different, different stiffness, different damping. Um, and now we have the full environment with the robot and the, the obstacles, and it's sort of doing the task. So we ran 20 iterations of online learning, where the robot repeatedly attempts to place the lifting strap under the hooks. And on the right, we show the success rates for each iteration. Our method focus succeeds more often with less data, compared to baselines that try to adapt to all the dynamics data um, and do not use our proposed weights. So here we have the real world evaluations. Again, the, uh, the task is to strap onto the, onto the hook. And after 15 iterations of adaptation, we evaluated focus in the best baseline 32 times. The baseline succeeded 11 out of 32 times, whereas focus successfully placed the strap onto the hook 15 out of 32 times. I'll also note that our method makes less contact with the environment, not because I said it had to, but because the contact dynamics are dissimilar to the unconstrained dynamics, and therefore the method avoided learning them. And because we're using an MDE, 
it also avoided executing them in Python. So those things sort of work together very nicely. Now, you might be thinking 50% is not a great success rate. Uh, it's an improvement up from 34%, but I think the main two failure modes are getting caught on something that's small in the environment and the error is sort of accumulating during the execution. So we're doing open loop execution here, so you planned you know, the series of, of uh, actions and you execute them without uh, direct feedback. So for accumulating error, I think MPC, uh, using that to track the predicted path, the predicted rev states uh, would improve success rates. Part of the reason we didn't do that here is because MPC can sometimes hide the flaws of your dynamics model. And we wanted to focus on showing that addressing unreliable dynamics does produce better plans. And for failures, where we get caught on something, uh, this is something that we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in the next chapter uh, when we talk about regrasping. So in summary, our proposed adaptation method focuses on regions where the dynamics are already accurate. And this allows us to skip a special pre-training phase uh, where we have to learn the unconstrained dynamics in the real world and just adapt from the unconstrained dynamics in the sim. Um, and so here, the experiments took you know, a few hours, less, certainly less than a day, uh, to uh, do both the online adaptation and also the evaluation. Free pause for question two. So you're effectively just trying to focus on dynamics that are already close to the dynamics, right? So then already close to the to the like to the real world dynamics or the end of the uh, sort of the other way around. To the, uh, okay. to, the to, to the dynamics that we've we, we so in simulation we say, okay, here's the dynamics we're going to learn. We call them unconstrained. They represent sort of the dynamics you need to do the task, but are simplified in some way. And so we pre-train that dynamics model for that. And we try to adapt that efficiently to the real world while ignoring the things that are that are sort of would be very difficult to adapt to. So a naive adaptation method would just fine tune on all of that. And what happens when you do that is you get a model that's sort of moderately bad everywhere. Right? It's not as good for my. So do you have like an idea of like uh, like where it's better or worse? Like I mean, you mentioned like some of those cases, but like maybe more like rigorously. Where where do you mean where? In terms of like what applications of this are best, or where in the state space, or where in in terms of error. Uh, let's say in the state space. Yeah. So so it's actually how do I say this? You can because you sort of set up the unconstrained dynamic simulation. Um, you can choose what you want to be part of the dynamics that you learn. Now there are some general principles, right? Contact dynamics are hard, so try to avoid learning all of the entire complexities of contact dynamics um, as a rule. And so therefore it's not gonna, you're not gonna expect to be able to do tasks that require the sort of whatever dynamics you've chosen to leave out. Um, so it's not gonna work in those cases. Um, and it should work in cases where you have the dynamics that you need to do the task in your unconstrained dynamics and where you can critically you do this adaptation step to make sure that those sort of the, the close approximation you can sim is actually updated to match what you see in the real world. Okay, so um, how dynamic do you assume your dynamics are? I guess in other words, um, do you assume the rope moves fast enough that like inertial effects and swinging become a significant factor or do you like assume the rope stays static between movements? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I'm saying dynamics, but I actually often mean quasi-static. So unfortunately, uh, we're not doing a lot of uh, lassoing. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we can talk more about that at the end. Um, we don't have any experiments where there's significant dynamic motion. And in fact, we, we often just leave velocity out of our state space entirely, primarily because we have no way to perceive it reliably other than finding differencing states, which is, is that really giving you any benefit? Um, so yeah, but uh, we're mostly looking at quasi-static things. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about what that means application-wise. OK, so yeah, we have this method for, for learning dynamics and learning reliability. And that has allowed us to do some tasks. But we haven't talked at all about grasping or regrasping. So in this final chapter, we're going to explore how we might expand to that. So here are three specific reasons why uh, we might want to introduce regrasping. I think the main one is that you are able to do more tasks or maybe more parts of a task. Uh, if you're supposed to install a hose, you should start by 
grasping the hose, but up until now we've kind of skipped that part and just put it in the robot's hands. Um, but another reason is to uh, recover. So when you're stuck on something, sometimes the easiest way to do with that is a regrasp. Or sometimes it lets you complete the task more quickly than you could do with one hand. So in the spot example, where it's grabbed the cable all the way at the end, and somebody's you know placed some obstacles here, and you sort of you can't pull the hose any further to the right. Um, it makes a lot of sense to go over and regrasp near the point where it's stuck to fix that. Uh, or in this example, where Val is holding this cable and he's trying to plug it in over power strip in the left. Again, it makes sense to regrasp so that you can use the left hand. Uh, otherwise, the robot will get stuck on the obstacles. So you might have seen grasping or grasping of deformables in other works, such as um, you have knot tying and untying, you have dressing, donning, or cloth smoothing tasks. Um, but these methods, I would say, aren't a great choice for the cable manipulation tasks that I'm interested in. In cloth smoothing, the regrasping is kind of part of this pick and place action representation that's being used, which is a little too restrictive for most cable manipulation tasks. You want to be constantly letting go of it. Um, in dressing and donning methods, they generally know where they want to grab a semantic point like the elbow or the shoulder. So it's more of a problem to identify where that is. And in work on not tying and untying, you are planning where to regrasp, but the methods are pretty specific to planar not tying or untying. In contrast, I'm interested in cable manipulation tasks, and an important difference here is that we're going to be considering obstacles and clutter. So most prior work hasn't tested in clutter, it seems, uh, and that makes perception, motion planning, and grass planning more difficult. You may, for example, now have to consider reachability. Can I even grasp that point? Or maybe it's covered by something, or maybe it's too far away. So there are a lot of challenges here, and there's lots more to be done. Um, but I'll show that we've made some progress in these areas. I'll describe the full method in a moment, um, but the main contribution here is in the grass planning step. So let me describe kind of why this is hard. So let's say the goal is to bring the tip of the cable to the power strip on the left. How should the robot grasp the cable? Well, in terms of search, this is kind of a tricky problem. You have discrete variables like which arm to use, uh, and then you have continuous variables like where along the rope to grasp. And then what joint configuration to use to achieve that grasp, right? There may be many of those. Um, and the grasp that you choose may then affect how the arms can move in the future. You might not be able to reach the goal because uh, some grasps, uh, maybe they get you caught on the obstacles um, or, or they make it uh, impossible to reach the goal. But having to sort of roll out your controller and your dynamics to see what would happen for each grasp um, is very slow, uh, which is also one of our baselines, so we know this is very slow. Um, and so instead, what we propose is to look at the topology of the grasps as a sort of approximation to what would otherwise be a very long horizon, uh, expensive planning problem. So what do I mean by topology, uh, and how is this relevant for planning? So let's use this example. Notice how it's possible to grasp the tip of the cable either from the left side or the right side. But these two grasps are categorically different in the sense that we cannot smoothly deform from one to the other without breaking the grasp or the frame. And that's what I mean by topologically different. So this happens because when we grasp, we form a loop, which we call a grasp loop, shown as this red line. The grasp loops on the left and on the right are topologically different with respect to the orange obstacle loop. One is linked, one is not. And this is useful planning, useful for planning in two ways. If you know uh, that you should or should not be linked with an obstacle, you, you know the desired topology, you can immediately rule out all grasps that don't achieve that. Um, but even if the task doesn't require a specific configuration or topology, we can ensure that the planner always tries a new topology once it gets stuck. And this is very cheap to compute, and in our experiments, very effective method. In essence, the key insight is that the robot, cable, and environment form a graph of grasp loops. And we can use this graph to construct what I call the grasp loop signature. And that signature generalizes to any number of grippers, uh, obstacles, uh, and can handle things like points on the cable being fixed to the environment. So to compute this signature, 
we start by converting the state into a graph. The vertices are the grippers and the robot base, uh, or maybe the attached points where the cable is fixed to the world. We also assume at this point that we've decomposed the obstacles in the environment into these obstacle loops, so that's the orange loop there. From this graph, we then extract the cycles and convert each cycle, which is sort of abstract loop, into an actual 3D closed curve, um, which we're going to call a loop. So that gives you the grasp loops. For each pair of grasp loop and obstacle loop, we compute the eight signature, which is defined by prior work in Bhattacharya et al. And simplifying a little bit, it's one if the two loops are linked and zero if they're not. So in this example, um, the eight signature is one. And so the grasp loop signature is also essentially just one. Now, if we consider the fact that this cable is actually fixed to the wall in the back, um, that introduces another vertex, A1, that results in another cycle in the graph. And then that gets converted to another grasp loop, which is shown in green. So it goes up the right arm, along the cable, and then back to the base of the robot. That grasp loop is not linked with the obstacle loop. So the A signature is zero. So the grasp loop signature is essentially one common zero. So here are some environments and applications where the grasp loop signature could be useful. We conducted planning experiments in the first three. So here we show uh, simulations of our robot Val doing some uh, untangling or threading tasks uh, with like a computer rack obstacle uh, or you know, these loops that you're trying to thread through uh, sort of resembles a cable harnessing task. Um, example four shows a drone team lifting uh, some large agricultural pipe or, or some tube. Uh, and example five, you have a humanoid robot that's grabbing this box off a shelf. And here you might need to reason about does the arm go around, like around or inside of this um, vertical beam on the shelf. Um, and all of that might be useful for planning. Uh, I'll also note that it works in cases where there are no obstacles, so it's still well defined in that case. So we can do tasks where you have this cable that you need to sort of pull towards you. Um, so those are some examples. Hopefully you have an idea of what the signature is. And now I'll show you how we use it in planning. So we have a, here a pseudocode version of the method. We use model predictive control with Mujoko as our dynamics model. And that's just to make progress towards the goal locally from the current grasp, um, whatever the current grasp is. And we use trap detection. So if the trap is detected, essentially we're stuck, we're going to plan and execute a regrasp. The trap detection comes from a uh, TAM PC, and it's essentially looking for small changes in the state. Uh, but the core of the method is plan grasp, which does the grasp planning using the grasp loop signature. Um, generally, what the planner is doing is searching for a good grasp that achieves some goal signature if we have that defined by the task, or otherwise just changes to some new signature. So very briefly, we can frame that planner again as an optimization problem. The decision variable here is L, which are the grasp locations along the DOO. And the cost consists of a few terms, which I'll go through. The first is a large binary penalty if the grasp locations are feasible, um, say it's out of reach or covered by an obstacle. The next term uses the grasp loop signature. So the next, yeah, next term uses the grasp loop signature to penalize either not achieving the goal signature or to um, penalizing not changing the signature, essentially. The third and fourth terms penalize large changes in the robot or the DOO state. And the last term penalizes uh, the geodesic distance to a key point on the DOO. So if you know that you're trying to plug in a cable, you want to encourage it to grasp the tip, and we have a term for that. So we solve this approximately by sampling a bunch of grasps and choosing the best one. And we can now see this in action. First in simulation, this animation shows how the signature can be used to manipulate a cable uh, in this environment with a computer rack. It's trying to bring the tip of the cable to this purple goal region. You can imagine it's trying to plug in an ethernet cable. And this shows the grasp loop and the obstacle loops that uh, we're using here. So here it gets stuck. And so we'll invoke the grasp planner. And there's no specific <laughs> goal signature for this task. So what this shows is that the planner will find a grasp that has a new grasp loop signature, so something that should be topologically different, which in this case means grabbing under with the left hand, which creates different loops with respect to this beam sort of 
closest to you. Uh, it gets stuck again, realizes that it can release with the right hand to change to yet another signature, um, and then gets stuck one more time because the length of the cable is limited, so it, it gets stuck trying to pull it up. And then finally, it makes one final grasp at the tip of the cable uh, and brings that to the goal. So here is sort of a, a real world demonstration of this pipeline. The goal here is to move the tip of the cable through the frame and bring the tip to this power strip here on the left. Here there is a goal signature, so it's going to grasp in a way that ensures that the cable is fully threaded and not some clever thing that just kind of pokes it through. Uh, and the grasp loop signature, grasp loop signature is what ensures um, the planner takes the correct actions. Um, we're using CDCPD2 uh, to track the cable. That's uh, some deformables tracking uh, stuff that our lab has worked a lot on. Um, there's a lot of compounding errors here. Uh, the robot has a lot of backlash. Um, there's multiple cameras that need to be calibrated. And we're using Majoka Dynamics, like I said, and that's not perfect either. Um, so we use visual servoing to ensure that we uh, can reliably grasp. Once we complete the grasp, we go back to running MPC, and it brings the tip towards the power strip, and the task is complete. So finally, I wanted to elaborate on how one could combine the methods from chapters one to three with this regrasping. So one way to do this would be to learn the dynamics online using focus. Instead of the carefully tuned Majoka dynamics, uh, which is what we did in this chapter. Uh, alternatively, you could keep the Majoka dynamics but learn an MDE online, perhaps also using data augmentation like we did in our system. And then you could use this MDE to penalize predictions, uh, bad predictions during MPC. To be clear, we did not evaluate these approaches, um, but I think that bringing these things together could allow us to have the benefits of efficient adaptation, as well as the topological reasoning and regressment capabilities. So I'll bring back our overview diagram here. Uh, which shows the full journey from learning unconstrained dynamics in SIM to regrasping in the real world. The work I've presented here has been published in five conference and one journal papers. Uh, and with that, I will conclude the presentation. I'll start by thanking my partner, Andrea Seifas, who can be seen here threatening me with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I have to thank my lab mates and my collaborators over the years for their ideas and support. Thank you to Dale to mentoring me uh, at the beginning of my PhD and getting me on the path to success. Thank you to Tom and Johnson, who have been here in the ARM lab with me for almost six years uh, and have had a huge impact on the lab. Thank you to Alex and Oliver for being really great collaborators. Uh, it was a pleasure working with you guys, um, and you have contributed many, many great ideas. And to all the other people uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with here in the ARM lab from a very long time ago in our old building in ERB um, to pretty recently, with some new robots and a lot of new faces, uh, you guys have all been really great. And of course, to everyone who's here on Zoom, friends and family, uh, teachers, I appreciate you all very much. Uh, and I'll leave the slide up as we move into the public uh, Q&A section. Thank you.